The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson. Book Two North or Be Eaten. Chapter 58 Gammon's Bargain. The first time she tried it, they were in Poto's room. Marley, Oscar, and the Igbys sat in a circle on a rug in the center of the floor. Lily raised her whistle harp to her lips and played a reel called Shovel the Hay, It's Donkey's Food. Janner clamped his eyes shut and thought about Tink. In the darkness of his vision, he saw geometric shapes drift and blossom, but nothing special happened. When Lily had played the song through a third time, he gave up. Nothing, he said. Maybe I'm not playing well enough, Lily said. No, you're playing just fine. Naya said, perfectly. Maybe it has to be a certain song, Oscar suggested. What about the one from the first book? Or the one that you played for Nugget. Do you remember that one? Janner asked. I remember it exactly, Lily said. Try it, dear, Naya said. Once again, she played, and though it brought back to Janner's mind all the memories of that day on the cliffs when he had first heard the sea dragons in his head, he saw nothing. He opened his eyes to find them all looking at him. Sorry, he said, and they bowed their heads with disappointment. Maybe we should leave you two alone, Naya said. They filed out of the room, leaving Lily and Janner facing each other on the rug. Lily played song after song, and Janner thought so hard that his head hurt. But nothing happened. They found the others in Oscar's room, and they leapt to their feet when Janner and Lily entered. It's not working, Janner said. I'm sorry. We've been talking loud, said Bodo, and it makes no difference either way. We're gonna go get him, all of us. All of us? Aye. Seems to me that every time this family splits up, bad things happen. We'll head south again, then figure out what to do next. Maybe we'll head to the Foob Islands. Poto cleared his throat and glanced away. I remember there's a fort there. That must be where the Fang outpost is. Though it doesn't make much sense. Last time I was there, it was white with snow and sea foam. Not a likely place for the lizard men would be able to survive. But Gammon said these were different. The Nags enlisted another brood of fang that can kick the cold. Point is, we can't sit here and do nothing. Let's go get your brother. Yes, sir, Janner said. Then he ran to Poto and hugged him tight. When do we leave? Lily asked. First thing in the morning, Naya said. We need to arrange with Gammon for the use of a few boggins and a team of Chorkneys. Chorkneys? Janner said. Lily's eyes glowed. I have to show you. They're beautiful with the softest feathers. The keepers let me feed them sometimes. There'll be time for that in the morning. Naya said, you children should go to bed. I'll stock the packs and make ready so we can get an early start in the morning. Janner told Marley and Lily good night and went to his room where he lay under his covers and stared at the icy ceiling. The frustration about the song was gone. The regret that he would be so soon in leaving the comforts of Chimera was gone. His heart sang with the hope that there was even the faintest chance that he would see his little brother again. At last, he slept. A knock at the door woke him. Janner sat up and rubbed his eyes, remembering at once that the journey awaited. He threw on his clothes, grabbed the fur coat from the hook, and flung open the door. His smile vanished. A Chimeran stood before him, his long beard caked with ice. He was out of breath, and he wore a burly gray fur coat that hung to the floor. What is it? Janner asked. Sorry, the man said, and he lunged forward and tied Janner's arms behind his back before the boy knew what was happening. He pushed Janner ahead of him, past Lily's empty room, then Naya's room, then Poto's. They were all empty. Poto's door hung crooked, and his bed had been toppled in a struggle. What's happening? Where's my family? Where's Gammon? Janner asked, but the man said nothing. They passed the big doors to the dining hall and snaked through the iceways of Chimera, past storefronts cut into the ice, past kitchens and dwellings where children played. 
Whenever they met Chimerans, they looked confused and backed against the walls so Janner and his captor could pass. Finally, they rounded the corner, and Janner saw him, flanked by a small company of armed Chimerans. Gammon! he cried. What's happening? Where's my family? It's all right, lad. It'll be fine. I just can't let you leave. He turned to the man behind Janner. Thank you, Earl. It's safe to go inside. Yes, sir, said Earl, and there was worry in his voice. He led Janner into a small chamber. Oscar, Poto, Naya, Lily, and Marley sat gagged and lashed to a long bench in the center of the room. Janner noticed Marley no longer wore a dress, but breeches and a coat, just like Janner. The walls were made of stone instead of ice, and a torch sputtered on the floor. When Poto saw Janner, the old man grunted and struggled at his bonds, and Earl tensed. It took four of us to bind him, lad, said the Chimeran. Nearly killed one of us, even with the bad shoulder, said another warrior just outside the door. He's a strong one, your grandfather. Why are you... Janner began, but the man tied a gag around his mouth, and in moments he found himself strapped to the bench beside the others. That will be all, Earl, said Gammon. Be sure Elmer and Olsen are well tended to. They took quite a beating. He lowered his voice. Then make ready as we planned. You're certain? asked Earl quietly. Yes, more than ever. Thank you, friend. Be ready. Yes, sir, said Earl, and the men clasped hands. I didn't want it to come to this, Gammon said to the Igbies. I told you to stay and rest. I told you to make yourselves at home. I told you to give up on Kalmar. But you wouldn't listen, and there you sit. My men have learned that it's good to listen to me, haven't you, men? Aye, sir! they said from the hallway. You must understand that, what I, that I would do anything to protect Scree. I can't just let you go, not when the fangs are expecting me to deliver you. If I thought there was any other way but to hand you over, I'd set you free. But it's you Nag wants, not Scree. All I have to do is give you to him, and he's agreed to leave these lands. Call me evil if you like, but the greater evil is the suffering you brought to my country. Do you need me to convince you? Yaman placed a foot on the bench where they sat. Olfen, Erland, come here. Two of the big men from the hallway stepped inside the chamber. Olfen lost his parents to the Fang invasion, burned his home, killed all his livestock. Erland has a similar story, don't you, Erland? Aye, sir. My whole village was raised. I'll be right glad when you turn this lot over to the Fangs, sir. Gammon spread his hands and smiled. I sent word by Crow as soon as you arrived that the jewels of Anaria were caught at last. Poto, Janner, and Marley all growled and struggled. Janner was tired of betrayal. He was beginning to believe that no one in all of Air We Are was trustworthy. The older he got, the more the world proved itself a crooked place. Beware, said the sea dragon, and now Janner knew. It was Gammon all along. Gammon, who wanted to use the young ones for his own ends. And Janner had been too foolish to see it. He had followed the man right into Chimera. I had a farm, said Gammon. Janner grew still. He tried to imagine Gammon without his black clothes and commanding presence. He pictured him with a hoe and a straw hat, but it was so ridiculous that he snorted. Gammon shot a look at Janner. Funny, is it? he said, and Janner feared the man would strike him. But Gammon chuckled. <laughs> I suppose it is. I must tell you, I'm a much better soldier than I was a farmer. I could hardly grow a potato bigger than a grape. But my wife, Yona, could turn even the smallest potatoes into a fine meal. When the fangs came, my poor Yona was killed. They left me my daughter, he said, glancing at Marley. It would have been about your age, lass. But a year later, the black carriage came and tore her from my arms. That day, I swore I would serve Scree. I'd do whatever it took to set my land free. You understand? I'll do whatever it takes. Janner stared at him with a confusion of sympathy and outrage. I don't know why Nag the Nameless wants you, Gammon shrugged. And I don't really care. I didn't even believe Anaria was real until you showed up here. 
But if I can use you to banish this evil from my country, then I'll do so. At least this way your capture will mean something. Take heart in that. He knelt in front of Marley. I'm sorry, lass, but sometimes things must be done whether you like it or not. You'll have to pass for the other boy. Gammon placed a hand on her shoulder. She thrashed like a wild animal, and Gammon recoiled. He straightened and said, That's all. I'll send for you when the time comes. The fangs will be here soon. They sat for a long time, listening to the sputter of the torch and one another's breathing. They each took a turn, twisting their arms to loosen the bonds. But it was no use. Soon the silence was broken by sniffles, and Janner saw Lily was crying. Naya tried to talk to her through the gag, but it was no use. When Lily's tears ebbed, she began to hum. She had no whistle harp, and she could form no words. But the melody that emerged dripped with weariness and sorrow. The song filled the chamber, and all their hearts, even Marley's, resonated with it. Janner looked at each of them in turn and saw their cheeks were wet. Janner closed his eyes and saw bright colors. His mind was vivid with swirls and bursts of movement. He soared across the steeps of the stony mountains, so close to a grimace of snick buzzards that he saw the tiniest feathers on their rumpled necks. Then he swooped down past a foraging abominable across the foothills and south of the barrier to the mighty Blap River. He felt the vision heading south toward Glipwood, but he remembered from the maps where the Foob Islands lay, and he pressed his mind eastward. The image responded, and his view swung left. He skimmed the tops of the Glipwood trees and caught glimpses of the river below until the land fell away and he beheld the chaos of Fingap Falls. He guided the image north and east over the dark sea of darkness until he saw a cluster of brown islands just off the coast of Scree. Closer he flew to the islands until he could make out the masts of ship and gray shapes moving on their decks. He wanted to move closer and he pressed his mind that way, but the image seemed to resist and he remembered his mother's words. That you can see these things when she plays is a gift. Never try to become its master, but serve it. Allow it to be what the maker meant it to be. Janner let go and allowed the image to go where it wanted. He heard dimly the notes of Lily's song, and he prayed she would keep humming. He sensed he was close to something. The image sped past the islands, north along the coast, where the stony mountains spilled their giant crags into the sea, until the land whitened with snow. The flat nothingness of the ice prairie stretched away to the horizon, and Janner, won Janner wondered what he was meant to see. Then he detected a speck on the horizon. The image whooshed near with every note of Lily's song, and the speck grew in size until Janner saw what it was. It was such a shocking, baffling sight that he cried out, and when he did, Lily's song cut short and the spell was broken. Janner opened his eyes and saw only the gray stones of the cell, but what he had seen in his vision was burned into his mind. It sent a violent shiver through his body and a jubilant cry out of his mouth. He sat on the bench in his bonds, bouncing up and down like a toddler throwing a happy fit. Munt! He said through the gag. Munt! Munt! They looked at him like he was mad, half concerned and half amused by the joy on his face. Munt! He said again and again. They couldn't understand him, but he didn't care. He laughed and whooped and shook his head with wonder. Every time he calmed down enough to see the looks on his family's faces, their confusion was so delightful that it sent him into another fit of joy. What is it? Their faces asked. What did you see? He could hardly wait to tell them. The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson. Book Two. North or Be Eaten. Chapter 59. The Transformation Artham pressed his feet against the cage door and his back against the rear bars. He clenched his teeth, clamped his eyes shut, and pushed with all the strength in his heart. The eerie melody filled his ears, and above it he heard one of the gray fangs shout, Eyes on the bird man! He's trying to break the cage! Artham felt hairy paws on his arms and legs, and more than once the butt of a spear smashed into his face. But he mustered his strength again and pressed. 
the bars of the cage were thick, but Artham felt the tiniest give and it renewed his strength. Again and again, pain flowered in his face as the fangs tried to stop him. The bones in his knees and back throbbed and threatened to break if he pressed any harder. The melody from the chamber swelled, and even with his eyes closed, he saw the bright flash of light. Espen! He screeched, and in a loud voice, he sang along with the melody that came from within the box. The melody he had tried so many years to quiet. He could run no more from his darkness. The voices in his head that cried coward and weakling drew back into the shadows. He knew he was those things, but feared them no longer. Then another voice spoke. It called him throne warden and protector and uncle. And at last he believed it. A surge of power ran hot through his bones. With one final shove, the cage splintered into pieces. Greyfangs tumbled backward. Bent steel littered the floor. Artham P. Wingfeather stood in the center of the debris, bloodied and panting, eyes ablaze. He was aware of an odd sensation in his back and wondered if he had broken some of his ribs. Children from the carriage scattered to the corners of the cavern, while the gray fangs recoiled and whined like puppies. Artham drew in a deep breath, spread his arms, and loosed a victorious scream. As he did, two graceful wings unfolded from his back, the feathers damp and glistening. They were dark gray with white flecks and speckled eyelets of the brightest crimson. Though they were still sharp as knives, his talons had narrowed and lengthened enough that they felt more like hands and less like claws. Artham felt lighter and stronger, and for the first time in nine years, his mind was clear and sure. The words to a hundred of his own poems scrolled across his memory. He saw faces of old friends, battles he had fought, and even the most terrible moments of his life. And yet he remained himself. The wild animal inside that he had struggled so long to kill pulsed with power, but it was no longer his master. He rode the pain like a knight rides a horse. He spread his wings and leapt twenty feet into the air over the heads of cowering fangs to the dais. He landed with sure feet and tore open the iron door. Tink! Kalmar! He cried into the darkness. Smoke wafted out. He folded his wings and entered the chamber. Kalmar! He whispered. He was answered by a whine from somewhere in the corner. Artham reached into the smoky blackness until he felt a furry arm. It trembled, damp and hot to the touch. The creature whined again. Hush, lad, said Artham. I've got you. Your Uncle Artham has got you. This story will end well. I don't know how, but things will be made right. Come on. Artham lifted the trembling thing and held it in his arms. He moved to the doorway and peered outside. The gray fangs had found their feet, but none seemed ready to attack the wild man who had just broken a cage to bits. Then a voice came from deep in the box. You're too late, Throne Warden. The boy is gone and a new thing has come, the stonekeeper said. Sing the song of the ancient stones and the blood of the beast imbues your bones. Artham paused at the door. He flexed his neck, shook the feathers of his mighty wings, and turned to the woman, barely visible at the back of the box. You call that poetry? he said. With Tink unconscious in his arms, Artham stepped to the edge of the dais and leapt into the air. His great wings beat the air and carried the two of them over the heads of the astonished gray fangs, even as the stonekeeper emerged and ordered the fangs to pursue. He landed lightly at the mouth of the tunnel from whence the black carriage had come, folded his wings, and sped toward the surface. Many gray fangs had gathered at the mouth of the tunnel when they heard the frantic voice of the stonekeeper from within. Artham saw their silhouettes clogging the exit, saw their wolf ears twitching. He lowered his head and slammed into them before they knew what they were seeing. He was running so fast that he had only to spread his wings and he lifted over the ferry, swooped high above the strait and glided in a slow circle above the island. The tiny figures of the stonekeeper and her gray fangs emerged from the cavern and gathered quickly into companies. Artham realized his vision was clear more precise than it had ever been. 
He could see the gray fangs, yellow eyes, the flecks of she shell embedded in the stone walls of the fort. The turrets crawled with gray beasts, organizing themselves much faster than any green scaled fangs that Artham had ever seen. An arrow whizzed past, and he saw with alarm that a regiment of archers had him in their sights. He clutched Tink's furry, trembling body close to his chest. Let's go find your family, your highness, Artham said with a smile. He drew in his wings and dove like a hawk, straight at the fort. The alarm on the Grey Fang's faces was worth the risk. He spread his wings at the last moment and skimmed above their heads in a blur. The Grey Fangs ducked and scattered. Artham's momentum carried him in a graceful arc over the strait, the rocky coast of Scree. He followed the mountainous coastline until the land flattened, white with the snow of the ice prairies. An armada of warships lined the icy coast, a hundred at least. The trampled snow around the ships gathered into a wide path that scarred the perfect surface of the ice prairies. The path led northeast, and he knew the gray fangs marched on Chimera. Down he soared until he flew just a few feet above the snow, following the contour of the prairie as it rose and fell in gentle, pristine drifts. Artham's eyes watered from the wind and from the speed and from the magnificent beauty of the land arrayed below him. Water streaked from the corners of his eyes toward his ears and, in the vicious cold, froze into silvery jewels. He would have to write a poem about this.